Hello, and welcome to today's Textile Talk. My name is Amy DiPlacido, and I'm the Curator of Exhibitions at San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. I'm excited to introduce two former artists in residence today, Anne Beck and Michelle Wilson. We're thrilled to show the work of these talented artists in our current exhibition, New Directions, which celebrates the museum's 45th anniversary and the five-year history of its artists in residence program. As a quick overview, the residency was established in 2016 as a way to support local artists with on-site studio space and opportunities to create and exhibit new work. This program has deepened the museum's commitment to supporting contemporary artists and strengthening the long legacy of craft and textiles in the Bay Area. Today, we will hear more from them about their work and what they've been up to since their residency. Textile Talks is a weekly virtual lecture series presented by six different fiber organizations each Wednesday, including Studio Art Quilt Associates, the International Quilt Museum, Surface Design Association, Modern Quilt Guilds, Quilt Alliance, and San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. Today's presentation and Q&A session will last for about an hour so that we can continue to offer these talks for free, I hope you'll consider making a donation or become a member of our museum. And we'll put those links in the chat in just a bit. During today's presentation, please use the Q&A for questions, the chat box for greeting others, and the post-event survey for commentary and constructive feedback. If you prefer not to see these notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button to toggle them on or off. We respectfully ask you to be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants. Thank you to our 2021-2022 Textile Talk sponsors who make the series free and accessible to audiences worldwide. Our sponsors include, at the platinum level, Moda Fabrics and Supplies and Quilting Daily. At the silver level, Arfil, eQuilter.com and the Torville family. And at the bronze level, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spool Seminars, Misty Fuse Attached Ink, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, Thai Silks, and The Quilt Show. And I hope you will support these sponsors. For those of you near San Jose, California, I encourage you to come visit the museum's 45th anniversary exhibition, New Directions. This special anniversary exhibition highlights recent acquisitions at our museum and a series of thematic installations. New Directions prominently features recent artworks from SJMQT's Artists in Residence program, which has supported the work of Bay Area artists since 2016. We are also exhibiting work by our current artist in residence, Olivia Ronan. In addition to this museum-wide exhibit, SJMQT also celebrates the museum's first collaboration with Kids and Art Foundation. The community of projects coming together, a quilt for healing, spotlights quilt squares created by pediatric cancer patients during an online art workshop. This project celebrates the historic quilts featured in Tan Tangela Irby's children's book, Pearl and Her G's Bend Quilts. For more about this organization, please check out their website. These three exhibitions will be open to the public during our regularly scheduled hours through July 3rd. To learn more about our exhibitions and upcoming events, please visit our website, sjquiltmuseum.org. And now I'm delighted to introduce today's speakers, Anne Beck and Michelle Wilson who work together as a collaborative duo under the name The Rhinoceros Project. Anne Beck is an interdisciplinary artist who works in a wide variety of media, from paper, print, and bookmaking, to painting, textiles, and social practice. Anne holds an MFA in painting from Pratt Institute and a BA in printmaking and art history from the University of Virginia. And her works are in the collection of the Smithsonian Institute, Yale University Library, and Museum of Modern Art Library, among others. She is currently developing a paper making research lab at the Lands Liquor Society in Northern California and is a member of the art and art history faculty at Mendocino College. Michelle Wilson is a San Francisco Bay Area based paper maker, printmaker, 
book and installation artist. She has exhibited her work both internationally and in the United States, including participation in biennials such as Philadelphia's Philographica 2010 and the 2006 Second International Biennial for the Artist Book in Alexandria, Egypt. Her artworks are in various collections, including Yale University, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and the Media Tech Andre Malo. Michelle is a past hand paper making advisor to Signa Haiti, a non governmental organization developing a sustainable and biodynamic economy in Haiti, and her imprint is Rosinante Press. Together, these two artists create craft based art and social practice platforms influenced by environmental issues. Today, they will be speaking about their first large scale collaboration, the transformation of Albrecht Dürer's. 1515 woodblock prints the rhinoceros into a life-size communally made embroidery and watermark on handmade paper. Today we'll be hearing from the artists on their experiences with the project, its development during the residency at SJMQT in 2018, and the new directions their creative work has taken since then. We are thrilled to display these artists' works at San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, and we're so excited to have you here with us today. Anne and Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hold on. I'm sharing my screen. And okay. So, uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to thank, uh, we both want to thank Amy and Samantha for inviting us here today and for all of you for joining us. So to introduce us, um, I'm Michelle Wilson and my collaborator is Ann Beck and we've been working together for seven years now on a collaboration we call the Rhinoceros Project. So the Rhinoceros Project began with our mutual interest in hand paper making and contemporary practice and has become a deep dive into global histories and philosophies and the potential of meditative craft to heal rifts. So today we're gonna to talk a bit about our circuitous trajectory and our evolving thoughts on collective embroidery, the environment and interconnectedness. We begin in 1515 when an Indian one-horned rhinoceros boarded a trade vessel in India to sail to Europe. Earlier that year, Alfonso do Albuquerque, governor of colonial Portuguese India received her as a diplomatic gift from Sultan Muzaffar Shah II, the ruler of Gujarat. And now she was on her way to become part of King Manuel I's royal menagerie in Lisbon. The rhinoceros, along with her Indian handler, whose name is only documented as Osem, made the voyage around the continent of Africa, following the same route navigated by Vasco da Gama almost 20 years prior that opened India to European colonization and competition for the valuable spice trade. A few decades before, the Ottoman Empire closed off the land route between Europe and Asia along the Silk Road, which sparked the maritime race to find the elusive spice islands and their abundance of medicine, preser preservative, and flavor. Upon arrival in Lisbon, the near mythic creature as the first rhinoceros in Europe for 1500 years became an immediate sensation. King Manuel pitted her against an elephant in a famous duel to test Pliny the Elder's assertion in his natural history that the rhinoceros is the elephant's mortal enemy. News of the spectacle spread rapidly through the land. Albrecht Dürer in his Nuremberg studio capitalized on this moment publishing a broadside of this famous woodcut as a souvenir of sorts that was sold by the thousands. Durer never saw the rhinoceros himself. He based his work on a description and a sketch that is now lost. Despite inaccuracies in the image, the rhinoceros appears to be wearing armor to have scales rather than skin and includes a mythic horn on its shoulders. His work became emblematic of a rhinoceros's appearance. Many more people saw the print than saw the actual rhinoceros. And the print was included in printed natural histories as an anatomical representation of the rhinoceros into the 20th century. The letterpress text above the image begins, 
on 1st May 1513, this should read 1515, was brought from India to the great and powerful King Emmanuel of Portugal at Lisbon, a live animal called a rhinoceros. His form is here represented. It has the color of a speckled tortoise and it is covered with thick scales. It is like an elephant in size, but lower on its legs and almost invulnerable. Currently, all species of rhinoceri are threatened. And if their species are lost, Durer's print could once again become a significant significant relic as to how they are remembered. So let's take a big step back here into the, the political maneuvering of empire building, the power of the church and the attitudes towards land and its inhabitants that our rhinoceros was caught up in here in the 15th and 16th centuries. This map shows a meridian line on the left. You can see my cursor, it's right there. Um, running from top to bottom through the tip of Brazil. And that was created by the Treaty of Tordesillas, signed by Portugal and Spain in 1494 in the wake of Columbus returning from the New World. The line divided all newly discovered lands between the two empires. All lands to the west were declared as belonging to Spain, all to the east of Portugal, regardless of who discovered or lived on them or claimed them first. As Portugal gained its foothold in the spice and color rich lands of the East, which would vastly enrich its empirical wealth, Spain, backed by the church in Rome, insisted that the Tordesillas line ran clear around the globe and that in fact, all Portuguese lands in India belonged to the Spanish crown. Favor shifted towards Portugal when in 1514, the year before the rhinoceros arrived, the Medici Pope Leo X granted a proclamation that limited the Tordesillas line to the Atlantic Ocean, effectively saving Portuguese interests in Asia. And so after the rhinoceros' um, show had run its course in Lisbon, King Manuel, as a token of gratitude and in hopes of continued favor for expansion in Asia, decided to gift the rhinoceros to the Pope's menagerie. The rhinoceros was loaded onto another ship and began the voyage to Rome. After disembarking briefly off the coast of Marseille for a viewing with King Francis of France, the ship encountered a storm and capsized near Porto Veneri on the Ligurian coast. Chained below deck, the rhinoceros drowned. In 2013, due to an odd confluence of events, including the grave recent extinction of the Western black rhinoceros, the imminent extinction of the Northern white rhinoceros and a relatively silly Facebook post alluding to Durer's print, we began a conversation about rhinoceri. We, Michelle and I, the incongruity of their being on the precipice of extinction with their perceived invulnerability in consumer culture and the potential creative approaches to questioning the value systems underlying this disparity and the Rhinoceros Project was born. So as papermakers, we're fascinated by watermarks. They're these magical ghostly images created by a presence and its corresponding absence. The raised lines on a paper mold create the thinning in the hand, a thinning in the handmade paper, which allows the light to pass through and creates the image. We thought this was this beautiful material metaphor for displacement, loss, and our time on the verge of mass extinction but also to hold space for the quiet wonder of that which is hidden, lies dormant, waiting to rise. Uh, we were inspired by the evocative story behind Durer's print, intrigued by the contextualization of the rhinoceros's journey as an early colonial displacement, and her death was a foreshadowing of the current plight of her species and others, our habitats and the planet as a whole. Originally, our endeavor had a simple goal, to make a watermark based on Durer's image. Rather than making it one-to-one -one scale of the print, we wanted to transform the image to a more provocative, absurd scale. And so we enlarged it to the size of a living rhinoceros, as best we could. We also decided to make an addition of six of these life-size watermarks to honor the then six remaining Northern white rhinoceros. This raised a technical question. Rather than sewing a form of soldered wire to a hard paper making mold, as in the case with traditional watermarks, how could we sew a watermark of this dimension in a more space sensitive 
durable and portable form. After some tests, we settled on the idea of stitching with embroidery floss on mu muslin fabric, which could then be laid over a hard form to be determined. But even sewing a life-size watermark embroidery is a pretty big task, so we decided to invite people to sew with us, making it into a community project. We traced the image onto muslin as a guide and then jumped into a project that evolved and grew and opened us to new ideas that we couldn't have foreseen. In September 2016, we held our first sewing circle at the San Francisco Center for the Books Roadworks Festival. We set only a few parameters for the stitching. Follow the line as a guide and tie off at the end of each line rather than jumping from line to line as one can in traditional embroidery. In this way, we hoped the consistency on the front and the back of the image would make for a clearer watermark. For novice stitchers, we'd recommend a running stitch, back stitch, or outline stitch. More experienced stitchers could surprise us. Everyone could choose their thread color and where they wanted to sew. The embroidery took nearly two years to complete, during which we visited 16 different communities. Some visits were for a single day, others like our residency in the maker space at the museum were for a longer duration. Um, our first extended residency was at Ramon's Taylor in San Francisco. So Ramon's Taylor is a former tailor shop in the Tenderloin district of San Francisco that's been converted to a storefront project space for artists to take risks without the pressures of trying to make commercial sales. And we organized the space into a sewing space in the, the storefront with the Rhinoceros Project reading room and ephemera collection in the back. And we invited the public to sew with us there. And as more and more drop-in visitors asked us questions about the project, it became clear to us that we needed to make visual all the complex ideas that we were thinking about. The project was about extinction and loss, but it was also about revitalization, myth, and wonder, and so much more. We decided to make a zine to explore these ideas. For the zine, we mapped out in several diagrams the history that led to Durer's print, its rippling effect through time and space, and the constellation of ideas that were both driving and evolving forces behind our project. We called it How the Rhinoceros. Our time at Ramon's Taylor and the articulation of this zine clarified for us that if we wanted to talk about the environment, extinction, habitat decimation, embracing a valuation of nature beyond or before it became a free resource for capital, that we had to delve into our personal and collective histories to tease out how all of these things came to be. So a year later, after we made the zine and our time at Ramon's Taylor, after, and also after having traveled around Northern California and to Kansas with the rhinoceros embroidery, we were invited to be artists in residence at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. In January, 2018, we recreated much of the Ramon's Taylor installation in the Makerspace Gallery and invited museum visitors to sew with us on weekends. So inspired by this like gift of time and space and materials offered to us by the museum, we began to expand our vision and assemble a kit to go along with our travels, both to protect our embroideries and materials while we travel, but and also to like add embroideries to the reading room and ephemera collection. And one of the things we made was this tablecloth for our sewing accoutrement table. Um, on it, we embroidered a compass rose, thinking about the history of nautical and celestial navigation and also charting a course forward pointing north. We also began an embroidered version of an enlarged page from our zine that was hanging in the makerspace gallery, thinking that we would replace the digital image with a more finished piece. Um, and an embroidered version of Vasco da Gama's seafaring route that we also had in the ephemera collection in the makerspace gallery. Um, and also for the museum's collection, an embroidered. Ah, we're, we're jumping ahead. The, yeah. Sorry, here we are. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> um, for the museum's collection, an embroidered rhinoceros and its reverse embossed in handmade paper. And these are currently on view in new directions. Into all of these pieces, we incorporated a piece of fabric we'd found in the museum's collection of materials that must have been issued in 1992, celebrating the 500 year anniversary of Christopher Columbus's 1492 journey. You can see it in the, I can't cursor, but the backing of the rhinoceros was themed the age of discovery fabric. Um, so during our last month at, at the, the textile museum, uh, Sudan, the last known northern white male northern white rhinoceros died and he left, there are now only two um, infertile females remaining on the planet. At the end of our three month residency, the rhinoceros embroidery was nearly complete with only a few lines here and there that needed filling in. In June 2018, we spent a week with friends and community at Pacific Textile Arts in Fort Bragg, California, sewing the final stitches. And all the while we kept track of, of people who sewed with us and what part of the rhinoceros they sewed. We assembled those names into this design, presently hanging near the finished embroidery in the museum. By the time the embroidery was completed, almost 600 people had contributed stitches to the eight by 10 foot work. Now we were ready to build the mold and pour the watermarks. We commissioned Anderson's Alternatives in Mendocino, California to build a mold and decal that pieced together and could be easily assembled and disassembled, complete with mitered ribs, all of locally sourced Douglas fir. For the surface of the mold, we used bamboo window blinds. On top of this, we stretched the embroidered muslin, clamped the decal box on top, and poured in the slurry of pulp. The pulp we used was a 50-50 mix of cotton and abaca fiber. Our test pour turned sculptural. The pulp was too thick and we used too much of it. <clears throat> the second pour proved much more successful. The pour was itself was accomplished in about a minute, which after two years of sewing and another year of fundraising and planning felt a bit absurd. And after two days of drying, we carefully peeled the embroidery from the paper. Both remain intact with no damage to the embroidery and no bleeding onto the paper from the thread. The watermark and embroidery were exhibited together for the first time at the end of 2019 at the Mendocino Art Center, along with our growing reading room and ephemera collection. Well before the rhinoceros embroidery neared completion in June of 2018, we'd moved way beyond seeing the embroidery as just a means to a watermark end. We'd come to see the process of sewing collectively with people as a form of group meditation that formed an interesting listening and sharing space. And we'd come to wonder, is reconnecting with our own bodies and a collective consciousness the beginning or a potential beginning to heal the rupture from the land that had been occurring since the rhinoceros was upheaved from India in the 15th century, and even well before that. We knew we wanted to continue this practice and began to explore what we might do next. In all of our research, um, we discovered that Dur, uh, about Dur and his rhinoceros, we learned that he had printed a woodcut map of Tenochtitlan, pre-Hispanic Mexico City, that was published in a 1524 edition of Hernan Cortez's letters to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, celebrating his conquest of the Aztec Empire. Nuremberg, where Dur resided, was a center for printing, cartography, weaponry, and finance during the time, this time of empire building. Nuremberg investors financed Spanish colonial exploration of the New World, and Spanish firsthand accounts of the New World were published in Nuremberg and disseminated throughout Europe. Like the rhinoceros, Durer never saw Tenochtitlan, and like the rhinoceros, the Aztec city and the lake that surrounded it were displaced by colonialism. 
This map of Tenochtitlan is now the foundation for another monumental collective embroidery and eventual work in paper. The map is a European interpretation based on Cortez's accounts of an American indiz indigenous cosmology. Oriented with the south at the top, the left-hand side of the map represents at a very different scale than that of the city, the Gulf of Mexico, <clears throat> excuse me, the Gulf of Mexico and southeastern United States, including Florida. On the right is the city of Tenochtitlan under the Habsburg flag, surrounded by Lake Texcoco with the raised causeways that linked the island city to the mainland. So in 1524, the year this map was published in Nuremberg, Cortez requested friars of the Franciscan and Dominican orders to convert the indigenous population. These friars established mission churches throughout central Mexico, up through Baja, California, and eventually up, um, and then later, and as the first European settlements in Alta, California, now the US state of California in which we live. As a way to explain the connections between the rhinoceros and the map, we made another artist book. Onward, <clears throat> pictured here, is really two artist books held within the same enclosure. In the first of the two books, we map the voyages of Vasco da Gama and the rhinoceros, Cortez and Junipero Serra, Serra, and the Franciscan missionaries' paths through Mexico and California. The second of these books explores some of the colors that were economic in incentives for colonialism as natural ink and dye sources, eight plants and one insect, and that can be found along the paths documented in the first of the Onward books. Um, in 2018, we were invited to the Textem Tercero conference hosted by the Museo Textil de Oaxaca in Oaxaca, Mexico, to launch this new embroidery. Later in 2019, we held our first US sewing circles on the map in conjunction with our exhibition at the Mendocino Arts Center. After the exhibition came down, we were taking a break to assess the whirlwind of the past few years and our future plans for rhinoceros paper pours and map sewing circles when it all came to a standstill with COVID. Like for many of you, we're sure, 2020 was a year of quarantine and social distancing for us. During that time, we began to embrace ideas of slowing down intentionality and the importance of stillness. While sewing the rhinoceros, part of the enchantment was that it was a shared endeavor between different communities. Prior to COVID, we had envisioned traveling with the map to sew with communi communities along a specific path, reversing the route of the Spanish missionaries through the Californias, and then from Mexico City to Veracruz, reversing Cortez's path of conquest, walking back through history. However, this idea relies on a level of safety of travel and gathering that is uncertain, not to mention funding. <laughs> um, and during our time under quarantine, we began to question this. It is difficult to consider how to move forward with a socially engaged project when the future of how we can engage is unknown. Um, however, this past summer, as, seems thing, as things seem to be opening up for the first time, uh, we were invited by Laboratorio Otto to bring the MAP project to Abruzzo, Italy as part of this new residency program called the Riabatari con l'arte. Uh, while it was too, felt too soon to be traveling and continuing with our project outside of our predetermined route and amidst these unknowns, we went on the adventure. Revisiting the project in Italy, we were given some insights. Perhaps right now, maybe along with embracing stillness, we also embrace adaptability, a softness, a blowing with the wind that allows for discoveries along the way. While we'd initially thought Italy was irrelevant to the map, we soon enlightened to the fact that the Spanish missionaries' path actually began not far from where we were staying um, in Abruzzo, in, um, in Assisi, 
uh, home to St. Francis, father of the Franciscan order, was very close. And also the name, uh, I'm sorry, he's also the namesake of San Francisco. And in Capistrano, which was 15 kilometers down the road from where we were, it's the birthplace of San Giovanni or San Juan Capistrano. We also tested out an idea we'd had over the quarantine. While the rhinoceros is sewn with commercially available embroidery floss, we want to incorporate local materials, fibers and dyes into the map embroidery. Abruzzo has a rich history of shepherding, wool trade and artisans working with fibers and natural dyeing. We purchased some local Gentile, Gentile di Puglia wool, some dyed with local saffron and dyed some ourselves with Montepulciano di Bruzzo wine and dyers chamomile and Eli Criso that we sparingly harvested on our excursions. Like the rhinoceros, the map is a document and a story, evidence of the many hands that contributed stitches. And now it's also a material record of the places to which we travel. <coughs> Excuse While me. We are still while we're still grappling with exactly where, where to go and what to do to move this project forward, what is very clear to us is the importance of using these historical images that speak to intersecting histories as jumping off points for conversations from many different contexts and perspectives. So over the course of gathering, sewing, research, and writing, we've honed in on some key ideas that we want to continue to investigate moving forward. From a contemplative perspective, that perhaps change can come from stillness as well as from action. That stillness is substantially different from stagnancy. And that creating a still, meditative, communal listening space is a powerful age-old tool that we want to continue to engage. That creating this space around a communal material project, we can aid in reconnecting us to our bodies and our material realities, our environments and the land beyond. From a political and social action perspective, that in order to best engage social and environmental issues of today, we must dig deep into our personal and collective histories, going back to, to the beginnings of globalization, to tease out common origins, interstices, and divergences, and altogether how we arrived here at the present moment. That our primary goal might be to find commonalities, community, connection, and healings in, in this time of insistent polarization. Thank you. And there are the rhinos at the museum. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Anne and Michelle, what a wonderful presentation you provided to our textile talk audience. And I'm going to ask our audience if you have any questions for Anne and Michelle, please put them in the Q&A and I will try to get through all of them. And one of the observations that I have had too is that you so seamlessly integrate so many different mediums in your process, embroidery, paper making, and print making too. But I'm wondering, have you ever seen something like this that's on the screen right now where somebody's taking the embroidery and using that as a matrix to create an embossed watermark? Has that ever been done before to your knowledge? Um, well, I wanted to, I'll, I, I think Anne has some thoughts on this, but I'll definitely answer that um, when we were kind of trying to figure this out, I think I literally put the call out on like a paper making Facebook group and was like, has anybody done this? And um, Bernie Vinzani, who is a paper maker in Maine, had responded that he did and it worked. And we were kind of like, okay, <laughs> but um, I don't think he ever showed me a picture that I can recall, but it was sort of what we needed. <laughs> but I, Anne, did you, was there more to that? No, I, I actually didn't know the answer to yeah. that. And I feel oh. like we should, shouldn't know the answer to that. I, I don't recall, um, it's such a labor intensive way of making a watermark when there's so many other, um, other maybe, you know, if, if, the, if the goal is to make a watermark, there are easier ways to do it. It's just that because it's so large, um, we wanted something that would fold. So yeah, I haven't really seen other, but obviously Bernie Vinzon. Yeah. 
And as you guys shift to naturally dyed embroidery floss, as opposed to the commercial that you were using at SJMPT, do you su suspect any of the color will actually leach onto the paper? Or do you think that they're mostly set or to be determined? I think it's definitely to be determined. <laughs> I think it's TBD. Um, uh, well, yeah, and we're still not quite sure. Like, I don't think we're gonna do the exact same thing with the map. Um, we've been talking about doing, instead of a watermark like this, doing um, embossing, in which case the, the colors leaching into the paper could be a really nice, um, have a nice bleeding effect. And we're much looser about this one than we yeah. were with the rhinoceros, like much looser. <laughs> Yeah, my thoughts exactly. That would probably yield such beautiful and interesting colors onto the paper. Well, I know that we got a lot of comments today too about how if they were at SJMQT or other residencies working on the Rhinoceros project that they would have loved to be part of this community project. Is there anything as the makers and the artists, is there anything where you were really surprised about working with either our community or, or somewhere else that you took this project? Um, trying to think. I were surprised. Did you go ahead, Anne? I think we've been. I think we've been surprised like <laughs> the entire time. <laughs> like it's been um, one kind of um, yeah, one surprise after the other from the very beginning. Like who thought that we would be sewing an enormous rhinoceros embroidery and carrying it around from place to place and going to Kansas and sewing next to a, an Indian one-horned rhinoceros. And um, yeah, it's, it's definitely been a process of discovery and surprise the whole way, I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think when we started the rhino, I was like, oh, this will be like a year and uh, <laughs> I don't know, a couple of months or so. I was really um, I think I want to mention, because I know some of my students are in the audience today, that um, when we started this, and this also, because I think there was a, a Q&A that was like how to get started. When we started this, uh, we were applying for residencies, places, <laughs> we, before we started, I should say, before we started anywhere. We, we thought this would just be like a month-long project, which it clearly wasn't, And people, but we, we applied to so many places. And... Um, we got rejected from all of them. And that was when we kind of reevaluated and had to come up with this, like maybe our model is not, we're just gonna do it in one place. We're gonna do it in different places and a little softer, a little gentler. And that was actually really great um, that we got to kind of come up with this way that, and so we, we were just sort of inventing it as we went when we really kind of flew by the seat of our pants um, we're trying to be a little more deliberate in this next embroidery. Um, but if you were, you know, I think I saw something that he was asking about starting this, you know, there was a family that came, I think, like at least twice when we were at the textile museum that got really excited about it. And um, the girl, the daughter of the family was like in sixth grade and she wrote about us for her school newspaper. And but she and her family went home and started a, a, an embroidery on their kitchen table together. And I think it was like of a giraffe or something Australian, kangaroo, but um, that, like the advice, I think I, the question was like, how do you get started? And I think the way is you just kind of start. <laughs> um, I don't, Anne might disagree with that. But <laughs> yeah, because I'm thinking back to your residency at SJMQT and we had really all ages participating mm -hmm. there with really all um, like, techniques, abilities, um, and you really didn't turn anybody away from participating. Everybody was welcome. I think you, you even had like four or five-year-olds. The youngest we ever had was a three-year-old that oh. needed some help, but they did it. And um, yeah. the oldest was was probably not polite to ask. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. And uh, reminds me, whenever you did go into residencies, did you, were you focused on any specific community groups? Was there somebody that you were really interested in, or was it really like everybody is welcome to come and participate? It, we, ahead, it's always been, no, it's always been that everybody is welcome. 
Where, you know, there, like when we were just in Italy, um, the, the hosts of the residency set us up with, um, you know, certain groups in the community, but the open um, sewing circles that we held at the, the residence where we were staying were open to everybody. Um, yeah. And in terms of, oh, go ahead. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, in terms of the um, programs to that support a project like this, is there anything that you hold in connection with the embroidery? Um, like for instance, one of the questions is, um, do you lecture on the history of embroidery or rhinoceros or the extinction, extinction of it? Is there anything kind of taking it beyond this project? Well, I would say, I mean, we do talks like this. When we're having the sewing circles, we aren't really giving a lecture. I mean, when people ask us questions, we definitely answer them. But a lot of times we're, we're more in the listener position. Like a lot of people want to talk about their relationship with rhinos or, or with the map, you know, any, anything they're responding to in the map or, um, you know, we, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a chance for them to tell us their stories. So. I mean, sometimes, yes, people do ask us questions and we, we kind of, we do answer, but our focus isn't, it's not a, it's not a lecturing that, space. <laughs> Go ahead, Anne. We're not, it's not a hierarchical situation. Yeah. Um, it's more of a, we're, we're, I think we're approaching the world with this project in a way that we are equal learners to all the participants or all of the people who are engaging. Like we are by no means experts in embroidery at all. Um, we have learned a lot of um, stitches from people who know way more about embroidery than we do, um, who have participated in, in our sewing circles. Um, and, you know, we're not, we're also not experts in, in why the reasons that the rhinoceros is becoming extinct. But, you know, these are all, I think, overall, like we are trying to approach um, the world, I would say, in a very holistic way, and trying to bring all of these different ideas together. And in these circular ways that we can um, engage with people back and forth about them. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think I mean, I think the other thing we have to remember when we get, we are, we're invited guests into these communities. And, you know, when you're a guest, you know, you have to be on your best behaviors, you know? So, you know, if we, we, we don't want to come in and just tell people what to think, we want to, and we want to have an exchange of ideas. And well said, I know that whenever we create pr public programming at the museum, we're always thinking, well, actually, people be interested in this and come and we always have an audience too. And I know that yours in particular, um, we have a first Friday event and you guys would be stitching and invite the public. This is pre COVID of course, mm -hmm. um, but it was just so great to see a, a true community coming together and, and bonding over this piece of cloth and, and learning how to stitch on the spot too. It's, it's really inspiring. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Well, it kind of brings us into one of my next questions, which is if somebody in the audience today was really interested in creating a social impact project, what advice would you give to that person? And also, how did you two really land on the rhinoceros as the specific iconography that you really wanted to move forward with? Like, how do you edit? Is another um, <laughs> another question. Well, I think you know because Anne and I are constantly applying for grants to to, to support this project, and um, you know every time we get we apply for a grant, there's always that question: of what kind of impact we want to have? And we've talked a lot about how I, I'm not trying to criticize your speech, but how we get we're kind of bothered by the word impact because at least for me, it implies sort of a lack of consent. Um, I mean, we're really trying to have like an, an exchange. Um, so I guess I would think about that if you're trying to do a socially engaged project, um, 
I think there's a very different thing when you're engaging the community you are a part of or a member of, and then I, like you have different sort of rights or rights isn't the right word, but like a different sort of nav way that what you what is okay to do versus if you're a guest in the community. Um, but I think there. What was the, the other part of the question? <laughs> Like what advice would you give to artists in our audience right now, or if they were really interested in working on a social type project, like how would you get them started if they're making aesthetically pleasing works, but they really want to take it one extra level to um, like socially engaged work. Um, I can say more, but I want to make sure. Anne, do you want to say something? No, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. It's fine. No, I'm, yeah. I'm good. I can't see any spaces because my screen is shared, so <laughs> I can't tell what I'm missing. But um, I think like Anne and I, I gotta admit, we kind of ended up on this model by accident. Like, you know, originally we were just, I think we were, our plan was just to make this watermark and um, just us, you know? And then we kind of started talking about all these ideas and it sort of grew from there. Um, I mean, I was, I gotta admit, I was really, I have a colleague in Chicago who was writing her doctoral thesis on women's sewing circles. And she was writing about them as, you know, we dismiss sewing circles as sort of quaint and cute and how the, she was pointing out these were these radical things where women came together and could multitask in a pre-industrial age where, you know, you could have social contact with friends and you could get work done and the kids could have a play date. I mean, and how this was a really innovative thing. And, um, and then later, you know, you have histories like uh, the Madres of Plaza del Mayo, who were like sewing circles were ways for them to like talk and code about like, you know, taking down or uh, fighting against a dictatorship. But anyway, that, that's a whole other talk. But um, I guess if you were interested in engaging a community, um, you know, like this came out of our work very naturally because we were both interested in these topics to begin with, you know, extinction, paper making, craft, um, social practice. Uh, I think the thing about it is you have to kind of, if you're going to do a socially engaged project, I think it, it you have to kind of think of yourself as sort of like you're steering a ship, but you're not necessarily the navigator, right? Um, like you're kind of the coordinator or the administrator of the project, but it, the ownership really belongs to the people who participate you have to let go of like this expectation of that it's going to be a certain way and um, be open to to the possibility that the community is going to change it. Um, you know, one of the things when we first started sewing, you know, we got these like on this project, I think we thought we'd like repair people's stitches if they weren't, you know, quote unquote good enough. And then we kind of realized that just even if these stitches weren't perfect or you know, beautiful, you know, beautiful in like a perfect way. They had this whole sort of a whole beauty all their own. And, and it was more important and more precious and more beautiful to show, to leave the stitches as they were. And, you know, we could, it didn't work at the muse, at the textile museum, but when we showed it at the Mendocino Art Center, we, you could look at the back, you could walk around behind it. And, and it was interesting because you could see all the fiber people like zip around and be like looking at the back and, um, I thought that we, we, I think we thought that was important that, I mean, the back is really beautiful, but it's all like gnarly and got weird stitches and I don't know, it's, but that's sort of amazing too. So I don't know if that answered the question entirely, but I guess my answer would be yeah, to, to be open to the surprise, be open to the possibilities, um, to understand you're not in control. <laughs> Yeah, to think of yourself as just a conduit to create this piece with community instead of being the driver. I like how yeah. you said that. Well, um, one question I don't actually know the answer to, but why did you actually choose embroidery in the first place? Um, Anne, do you want to take this? Well, because um, we wanted, we needed something that would, um, be thick enough to be raised on a paper making mold, um, but that we could carry around with us. And so, you know, we we talked, showed an image of a traditional watermark, which is usually made by um, a very carefully soldered piece of wire that's stitched to a rigid paper making mold. 
And so um, we thought we could replicate that by using stitch thread that could be pliable and foldable. And embroidery seemed the natural way to use thread in that way, um, fiber thread as opposed to wire thread, I, if that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And um, another question I don't know the answer to, how did you two meet? Hmm. <laughs> We met um, through paper making. I had a, um, a, a gallery um, kind of experimental space in Fort Bragg, California, and um, we were setting up a paper making studio there. And um, we had a, a show that went along with the inauguration of the paper making studio. And we invited Michelle and um, her project, her collaborative project, Book Bombs, to be part of that show. And I think that's, yeah, that's how we yeah. met. Um, yeah. I, was, I wasn't living in California at the time. Um, and so when I moved out here, I was kind of like, can we be friends, basically? <laughs> And then you were like, I love this person so much. I want to collaborate with them for three years. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And um, more of a funny question to think about as a thought experiment, but if Albrecht Durer were alive today, what do you think that he would think of your artworks? So well, hard to Go ahead, I Anna. think that he would I think you would. So one of the really interesting things along the course of our, um, before we started the project, we heard a talk at, um, what was it, the American? Was, what, yeah, the North, it's, then, it's now called the North American right. Hand Papermakers. They used to be the Friends of yes, Dark Hunter. Hard. Um, about Durer and his, his, the paper that he used um, I mean, it was about a lot more, but the the woman who was giving the talk uh, specifically mentioned that Durer ordered paper spe like specially made for him with no watermarks. So he was he did not like watermarks at all um, on the paper that he was printing on. I don't know. I tend to think that he probably would cringe or roll over in his grave about this project somehow. <laughs> I, I, I do know he, was, he had a lot of yeah. imitators. You know, he, he that AD, you can see very right here, you can see my cursor. He signed his works. He, he did this very elaborate AD. And because he was such a famous guy during his lifetime, people started adding that to their works to sell them and claim that he did them. And he actually took some people to court for copyright violations so funny how nothing has changed <laughs> <laughs> oh maybe he wouldn't be too happy with this but yeah but if printmaking is all about the dissemination of information then that's kind of what you're doing in this role too is to like bring this project to different community groups and mm -hmm. educate or maybe have a takeaway that they normally wouldn't otherwise have yeah yeah, although I think that, you know, for him and for any good capitalist, printmaking is about um, making money, you know, like <laughs> it was a way to to sell, um, you know, lower priced things to the people mm -hmm. who could afford it. Exactly. exactly. Well, that brings us almost to the end of our hour, but I just want to thank you, Michelle and Anne. Thank you so much for being with us today and for presenting this fabulous project too. We're really excited to see and hear where you guys go to next. Great, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, thanks those, everybody for being here. So for those of you in the Bay Area, our 45th anniversary exhibition, New Directions, will be on view through July 3rd. We've also put the artist's website info into the chat, so please make sure to follow them online. This is the first in a series of conversations with artists participating in our 45th anniversary exhibition. 
We hope that you will join us uh, for our next event in April 27 to hear from another former artist in residence, Alexander Hernandez. I want to thank our sponsors again for supporting this event. We'll be sharing a recording of this presentation on YouTube and Facebook in the next couple of days. And a big thank you to Lucy Shaken of Sakwa and Samantha Lyons from SJMQT for helping behind the scenes today. If you enjoyed this talk and would like to donate or become a member, please visit our website, www.sjquiltmuseum.org. Please join us again next week for a textile talk hosted by Sakwa. We hope to see you then. And thank you again, Anne and Michelle, and take care, everyone. Bye-bye.